I want to start today um, with a scripture. John 14 and 27 says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. We've been in this series, Remain in Me. And today we're going to conclude this series with talking about the, the peace that only God can give. The peace that only God can give. Last weekend, uh, Father's Day weekend, and, uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I love getting gifts. Do you guys like getting gifts? Everybody like getting a gift from time to time? Well, last, last week, uh, my kids surprised me with some great gifts, some great Father's Day gifts for the weekend. And, um, you know, I, I enjoy gifts that are practical. Uh, we're, we lead very busy lives, and we tend to not take very much time for ourselves, sometimes to our own demise. And sometimes even life gets so crazy, we don't buy the things for ourselves that we actually need because life is so busy. Can anybody relate? So sometimes a, a, a gift that is practical and something that we need uh, is very appreciated and, and very thoughtful. And so that, that, was, uh, that was this Father's Day for me. Um, I, I have, if you, if you know me, I only pretty much only wear dudes because they're so comfortable and they're kind of cool. And um, I, I have a lot of different colors, but what I keep doing is I keep wearing them out while I'm working and I get them dirty. So from time to time, I need a new pair. Now, notice I didn't say want, right? Because I don't want a new pair. I need a new pair <laughs> because the other ones are dirty, right? So, but my kids are so thoughtful. They got me a new pair of dudes that I can wear that are nice and clean. Isn't that awesome? So I love wearing these. I love the fact that I'm able to wear these today and a new shirt as well. These are some things that okay, I... Okay, but it wasn't just one new shirt. No, it was multiple okay, shirts. Okay, so I have to, I have to explain because Brad's not doing justice to this story. So, you know, as pastors, we get up at 3.30 on a Sunday morning. And so they know on, on these holidays that land on Sundays, like Easter, Mother's Day, Father's Day, they don't see mom and dad until honestly when, when they show up to church and we're all here. So like Mother's Day, I got up and there was this huge basket of all the fun things I love. My, my girlies, they shop for the boys and they outdo themselves. They know what I love. And so I got up and I'm going through it and they're in bed and I'm like, oh, I love it. Love the jewelry, love all the things they got me, but they couldn't see that. So Brad and I on Saturday night, um, we had ran to the dollar store to get something and we came back and the girls had surprised their dad on Saturday night. Thus it says, happy Father's Weekend, because it wasn't Father's Day yet. They wanted him to get it, and they wanted to see his face ahead of time. How many of you, when you give a gift, you want to see somebody open it? Like, sometimes you give those gifts, and they, they don't know what to do, so they're like kind of trying to be polite, and they're like, thank you. Open it. Like, open it. I bought it. I want to see. I want to see if you like it. And you're scared on the other side because you're not sure if you're going to like it. So, like, what if you don't like it? And then you got to fake it. So, it's like, oh, you know, one of those things. But the girls were so excited because they knew their dad needed dudes. They knew that he loved them. But, you know, our girls are 18 and they're pretty trendy. And they wanted their dad to be trendy. And they were not enjoying what he was wearing lately. Job. It's a big job. <laughs> so, they had, like, he comes out every Sunday or every Saturday night, he'd be like, girls, what do you think about this shirt? And they're like, burn it. Okay. What do you think about this one? Give it to Goodwill. No, it's not even worth that. Burn it. And so they went shopping and it was so funny because in these bags were shirt after shirt after shirt after shirt, all oh, which are Like cool. I get the hand girls. My shirts are <laughs> stupid. I get it. Okay. But <laughs> The, but the thought was so awesome Very because thoughtful. they love their dad and they wanted him to be cool and trendy. And so they got him not, not only not cool. what he wanted, but what he needed. What I needed. So this morning... I was honestly very excited. I could not wait to get in the closet and crack open that shoe box and pull out the new dudes so I could put them on and wear them today. Now, I, I, want, I want to just, I want to ask you a question. How insane would it be if I were to have been given this gift and this morning not even open it, just leave it in the closet, not crack open the box, not put them on, not enjoy them, not wear them at all. How dumb would that be? My girls gave me this gift and I'm not even going to use it, not even going to utilize it. I know you guys probably have never received any gifts that you didn't use, did you? 
ever. I think my mom is here today because I, I know I saw her. I gave her a hug before service, but I'm going to tell on myself, oh, she's right there. Okay, so maybe, maybe she won't hear me. You know, my whole entire life, my all-time favorite dessert has and always will be my mom's cheese blints. Now, if you don't know what cheese blints is, I doubt you even know Jesus uh, <laughs> because cheese blints is pretty awesome. Uh, so it, it's, it's, um, it's this, uh, how do you describe it? It's kind of like a, a, a warm, sweet cottage cheese type creamy filling on the inside. It's warm. It's kind of like cheesecake. That's a like, better way to describe yeah. it. And then on the outside, it's wrapped in a very, very warm, very thin, very moist, <laughs> so delicious crepe. And then it's there's like a this, skinny pancake. It's like a skinny pancake, right? And then it, there's this sugar sauce drizzled over the top and sliced strawberries, and it melts in your mouth, and it is so stinking Good. We should have made them for everybody today. Yeah, we could have done that. Susan, we got to do that sometime. Guys, I'm not lying. This dessert is amazing. I've enjoyed it my whole life. Every time November 21st rolls around, it's my birthday. She's like, what do you want? I'm like, cheese blints. I want you to make me some cheese blints. Well, one year, some years back, she thought it would be a good idea, since I love cheese blints so much, to get me a crepe maker. And she gave me the recipe to make my own cheese blitz. And though the gift was so thoughtful, mom, the gift was so thoughtful. Thank you. Thank you. We sold it a couple of years ago in a rummage sale. <laughs> and here's why. Here's why. I don't want to learn how to make cheese blitz. I want you to make me cheese blints. There's no cheese blints like mom's cheese blints. It just isn't going to work. So there's, there's no Brad learning how to make it, <laughs> and it'd be half as good as hers. Now, Lord forbid, but if there ever comes a day that she passes from this life, I probably won't learn how to make it. I'll just only miss eating her incredible cheese blints. But she gave me that gift, and I never used it, right? And we do the exact same thing with the peace of God. It is the gift that he has given us, and we, it's accessible to us. We have it. If you have Jesus living inside of you, you have access to the peace of God, and he promises you that you don't have to worry or fear or, or have any anxiety about anything in this life when you have the peace of God. And we're going to talk about that today. So in this series, we've been in John chapter 15, but this is going to take us back to John 14 because really John 13, 14, 15, and 16 is this conversation that Jesus is having the night before he dies. So he's with his disciples. They're having the Passover, that last supper meal, and then they're going for a walk on the way to the garden of Gethsemane. Okay. And so Jesus is basically, he's trying to wrap up everything that has that has kind of happened and about to happen. He wants to go over it with his disciples and make sure they're prepared because he knows what's coming. You see what he knew that they didn't is that he was about to be arrested. It was God's will. He was going to be crucified. It was also God's will. They were going to all desert him. Not sure that was God's will, but it happened, right? Humanity. So he's trying to explain to them, guys, all of these things are about to happen. It's going to get bad. It's going to be ugly. But listen, I want to give you a gift that I possess. So I want you to see this. This is something Jesus possessed. And that was, he said, I want to give you my peace of heart and mind. And then he follows that up with don't be troubled. Why would he say don't be troubled? Because he knew that humans are driven by our emotions far too often, okay? He knew by their faces, as he was explaining, guys, I'm gonna go away. And they were like, what? I, I don't understand. We don't want you to go away. You just got here like you're just now. Like everybody knows you're the superstar. You're Jesus, you're the Messiah. We've been following you for three years. Everything is great. You're doing all these awesome miracles. And he said, but I've gotta go. And it's actually better that I go. They couldn't understand that. Jesus also knew the trouble that was ahead. He knew that once he resurrected, 
He knew the persecution that was going to come. He knew that each of those disciples were going to die for their faith. And so he's trying to set them up. And so he tells them, don't be troubled. What he's saying is, do not be driven by your emotions. Don't go off what you feel right now. Go off what you know. Don't go off how you feel in this moment. You're going to feel scared. Right now you feel confused. You're frustrated. You don't understand what's going on. But we're not going to go off of our feelings. You see, I have given you a gift. I want you to accept it and use it. It is the peace that's going to guard your heart and your mind. And I want you, as before we kind of explain to you, how do you really experience this? Because like Brad said, there's too many people with the crepe box still in the cabinet. They love the crepes, but they're never making them. And the gift is still there. All of us have those gifts. So don't just think it's Pastor Brad. Every one of you have a gift sitting at home. Somebody bought you and they wasted their money because you're not using it. We all do it. But this is one of those gifts we don't want to do that with. But why do so many believers... Why is mental health the crisis of depression and anxiety higher now than it's ever been? I don't know if you follow statistics, but right now it is. It's higher than it's ever been. The amount of people, the amount of children and teenagers dealing with anxiety and worry and depression. Well, I want to help you to understand, first of all, what is it we're dealing with? The word peace, let's start with it simply means this. I want to give you the original definition in the Greek, and it means peace. It means quietness. It means rest. It means wholeness. And I want you to really, when you think about peace, I want you to think about it being the N word, wholeness. Okay. Some of you mamas are just like, but I like quietness. Well, that's good. But in this sense, I really want you to get it. It's wholeness. Okay. The very opposite of that is the word worry or anxiety. And here is the definition. When you go to the Greek and you begin to break it down in its original language, it means to divide or to separate. You could go farther to say to pull apart. Now, get this picture. If peace that Jesus gives is wholeness and anxiety or worry is to divide or separate. I want you to get a mental picture of what the enemy is trying to do in the life of every believer. He wants you to begin to look at your circumstances. He wants you to begin to look at the things that are out of your control. He wants you to begin to become fearful and have anxiety and worry over your daily situations and over the things going on in your life. And when you do, it begins to pull you apart. It begins to separate you and not just you, okay? We're not just talking about you and your emotions and your mental state and all of that. No, no, no. What he's really trying to do is he's trying to divide you from the vine. You see, if you've been with us in this series, we're talking about John chapter 15, where he said, remain in me and I will remain in you because apart from me, you can't do anything. John 15, four. So the enemy knows that in order for you and I to produce the fruit of the spirit, that love, that joy, that peace, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, walking in those things, he knows that if he can separate you from the vine, you will die. Come to my house. I can show you some plants that this has happened to. I should have just brought them, but they're just way too ugly because I'm not a good gardener, but God is. The fact is the enemy's job, what he wants to do is separate you from the vine. And I, you know, as we begin to mature and we begin to walk with Jesus, there comes points in our life where God is going to allow us to be pruned, go through some trials and grow. We talked about that in part two, okay? Nobody wants to go through it. Nobody wishes it up on anyone else. But guys, this is when we learn what the peace of God is all about. I remember probably the first time Brad and I as adults, especially after being married, that we experienced this is when we found out we were going to have AJ. AJ is our firstborn. He's 20 and he just got married. And um, I remember being so excited. Well, not really that excited because I'll tell you why. Because I'm a planner no, and this, we didn't plan at this very moment for cried. that to happen. You cried. I cried. Because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm still in college. And, but I went for six years, so I wasn't, you That's know. That's your fault. So, I know. 
I love school. If I could get paid to go to school, I would go. I love it. Kids are like, you're stupid. That's what my children said. But I remember going, we were excited. We go in for the ultrasound and you know, you just expect everything to be right. You just expect the pictures to be perfect and the doctor to say everything is good. We heard the heartbeat and that's not what they said. Actually, they sent us straight from our doctor's appointment onto a specialist to do another in color, which now is like, that's normal, but they were going to do it in color sonogram so they could see everything. And in that doctor's appointment, they prepared us that the doctor was going to give us an opportunity to abort our son. That's how bad they were making this out to be. They told us that AJ had a cleft palate and a club foot and his kidneys were enlarged and there was, there was an opening at the back of his brain. He had a brain tumor. And I'll never forget, like as bad things are being told to you, it takes a little bit to take it all in. And I remember just laying there and saying nothing. And then we left and we got in the car and I'm saying nothing. And then tears start running down my face. Mind you, I know what the word of God says, okay? I'm not a young believer at that point. I know what God's word says. And yet the emotions are starting to take over in that moment. This is what Jesus was saying. Don't, let, don't be driven by your emotions. You gotta be driven by what you know. And so that day, Brad and I went home without saying very little to one another at all. We just knew the only thing we can do in this moment is was we, gotta, we gotta just pray. We just gotta get in the presence of God. And honestly, it was so hard that we didn't even wanna pray together in that moment. I know that sounds weird, but like it was such, like we were grieving like even our future. We knew we were called to plant a church and we're like, God, whatever you're gonna do, you're in control. But I remember Brad left and he went up to the prayer tower at our college and I stayed in our tiny 600 foot apartment at this little love seat we actually had when we planted this church. And I knelt down at that and I began to bawl my eyes out. And my first question is, why God? Why, 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 why? As if that was gonna help the situation, because it wasn't. And it wasn't until I changed my prayers and my prayer came out of my mouth. God, I don't know what you're gonna do, but I know you're in control and I'm okay with it. God, I'm okay with it. Whatever you do, if you heal our son, I know you can heal him. I'm okay with it. If you choose to not heal our son, God, you're still good. You're still God and we're still gonna love you and we're gonna raise our son. No matter what happens, God, you are still good. And it was only in that moment that the peace of God began to fill our home. Brad had a similar experience when he was praying and when he came back, we began to talk and it was like, you know what? God's in control. No matter what happens, we're gonna walk this thing out in peace. We are not gonna let the enemy divide our mind and divide our marriage and cause us to be disconnected from the vine. You see, that's what the enemy me wants, whatever you're going through, whether you're walking through a valley now or you're going to in the future, you have got to know that you've got to stay connected. And the connectedness comes from this, guys. It comes from first, I'm going to give you two types of peace. First, you got to make peace with God. That's salvation, okay? You can't experience the kind of peace I had that day if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Your sins being forgiven. That's why Jesus died on the cross. But that second one, experiencing the peace of God comes only when you begin to trust God and you completely surrender control. You cannot try to remain in the driver's seat and experience the peace of God. Any control freaks in the room? Recovering control freaks? Okay, a few of you are honest. The rest of you, we're praying for you. No, listen to me. For some people's personalities, guys, anxiety and worry, it's at the forefront. Because some people that are that type A, that one on the Enneagram, that OCD control freak kind of person, we want everything perfect. And even if it's not gonna be perfect, tell me what the problem is and I'll tell you how you can fix it real fast. Whatever it means, I'll work as hard as I gotta work. You know, if you're that person, you know what I'm talking about. And then there's then these moments in your life where it's out of your control. And unfortunately, it's in those moments that we grow the most. See, God knew that we would have a ministry for the next 20 some years that would be full of those same moments. And if you don't know the end of AJ's story, AJ was born completely whole, healed in Jesus' name. Completely healed. He has a calling on his life. 
But even if that hadn't been the result, we've walked through other moments where we prayed for healing. And this is 10 years ago in the month of April that God called my older brother home. And you know, it was only because we walked through what we walked through with AJ that when Stan was sick with cancer, and I, we, we didn't preach this in the first service, but we felt like we weren't being transparent enough. When you go through hard times, guys, it is the peace of God staying connected to the vine that causes other people outside of believers to look at you and say, I don't understand. And you don't understand as believers why when a good God, why is God letting these things happen? Listen to me. We live in an earth curse system, okay? We live in a fallen world. So bad things happen, not because God makes them happen, but because sin entered the picture. And this is all just temporary. But what Jesus promised to you and I is a gift called peace. That no matter what you go through, no matter what tragedies you go through, no matter what trials you walk through. You see, on that side, we prayed and we believed and we knew God was a healer. But you know, in that instance, God's will was not that my brother would be healed. God healed him and took him on home. But can I tell you that we walked through that still with peace. Why? Because we stayed connected to the vine. Because we weren't looking at what was going on. We were looking at who was in control of our circumstances. That's right. I remember that day like it was yesterday as we were, we had been separated for a while. We had been praying and we both came together with complete and perfect peace in our little apartment. And it wasn't because God told us that AJ would be healed. It wasn't because we knew what the details of the outcome would be. It was simply because God had reminded us in private of who he is and who he would be as we were walking through whatever it was we were about to walk through. It was so unclear. It was all undetermined. We did not know the details. We had no idea what was around the corner. All we knew was he is God, and that he was going to be with us. He would never leave us. He would never forsake us. That is the peace of almighty God. It's not when things work out the way you want it to. It's knowing who he is when you're walking through it. You know, um, the disciples had to come to a point where they recognized and they realized who this Jesus really was. And all through the book of John, seven different times, Jesus tried to explain to them who he was because he knew the only way they would ever truly know how to embrace and take advantage of all of the wonderful things that he had for them, including his peace, is for them to understand who he truly was. So in all of these different statements... He begins with this phrase, I am. These two very simple, seemingly insignificant words, I am. These are seven declarations, powerful declarations of who Jesus is. When he began these sentences with the phrase, I am, they knew exactly what he was saying. He was declaring himself to be God. He was quoting Exodus 3 and 14. You know the story of the burning bush, maybe, where Moses is out in the desert. He sees this burning bush. The bush is talking to him. The bush commands him with his loud voice to go to Egypt and free the people of God. And Moses says, who am I supposed to tell them has sent me? And God says this to Moses, I am who I am. Am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Jesus was beginning every one of these phrases with, I'm God. And then he explains in seven different ways, uh, seven different explanations of the type of God he is. I'm not going to go through all of them, but let's just look at a few of them because here's what we need to understand is that when we have Jesus living inside of our heart, we get all of him. Everything that Jesus is, is dwelling inside of us. Yet so many of us each and every day are living with our faith in a stinking shoebox. It's unopened. We don't recognize or realize who God is and what's available to us if we will only be began to understand who he is. The first thing that he says in, in John 6 and 35, he says, I am the bread of life. How many of you guys like bread? If you're on keto, I'm sorry, get over it. 
<laughs> I like gluten free, you know, Ezekiel bread. You ever had that? There was this Italian restaurant that we went to. Um, Carino's. Joe Carino's, is that what it's called? In front of the mall in Joplin. You guys ever eaten there? They serve the most amazing bread. I think I've only eaten there once, but I remember the bread. And that was like 15 years ago. So if I still remember to this day how amazing that bread was, it was pretty stinking good. I remember it was very warm and you break it open, steam comes out and they serve it with butter and, and some oil, some olive oil, uh, herb, you know, dipping. It's so good. Oh my gosh. I feel like going to get me some bread right now. Bread was really big in the Middle East. And, you know, it represents, you know, uh, the, the food sustains us. It keeps us alive. If you're starving in the middle of the desert, even if you're on keto, will you take some bread? Yes. yes. You'll take you some bread, right? Bread is amazing, and it, and it gives us life. When we eat, we're nourished, and we live. Yeah. Jesus, he satisfies our deepest needs. Yeah. And it's only through him that we experience real, eternal life. In John 10 and 10, he says, I'm the good shepherd, right? He's not just any shepherd. He's the good shepherd. Now, why do you think Jesus declares himself to be a good shepherd? I want you to think about this for a second. How many of you guys have sheep? No, I didn't think so. Well, just imagine with me if you had a flock of sheep, okay, uh, and you have them out in the pasture, all right? Um, as a shepherd, your job is to lead them, to feed them, to protect them, and sometimes correct them, all right? What's going to happen if you leave your flock completely unattended overnight? What do you think is going to happen? Probably going to, yeah, they're going to scatter, and then they're probably going to get attacked by some sort of predator, right? Here's what happened to you and I. Here's what humanity did. We turned our back on the very God who created us and wanted a relationship. We turned our back on him with this three little offensive word called sin. And when sin came into the picture, here's what happened. We separated ourselves from him and we hid his face from us. He didn't hide his face from us. We hid his face from us because sin separates. Sin leads to death. So we as the flock turned our back on our shepherd and we said, we can do this without you. We're going to go with what we want, not with what you want. We left ourselves wide open for attack, vulnerable to the predator. But Jesus being the what shepherd? The good shepherd. He said, I'm not going to allow them to die in their sins and die to the attack that they deserve, but I, as their good shepherd, am going to step into the picture and I'm going to offer myself to be taken by the enemy, to be destroyed on their behalf because of their sins. I'm going to lay down my life. A good shepherd lays down his life for his flock. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He gave up his life so that we, the flock could live. Here's the beauty of this picture is that our shepherd isn't dead. Our shepherd is very, very much alive. He rose again on the third day. He is the re resurrection. Guess what? He says this in John eleven twenty five. 25. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. This is why we're so big about baptism here at this church is because that's a beautiful picture of what the resurrection is. You know, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and this was a type of resurrection in Christ. And when we are baptized, here's what's happening. We're saying we're going from that old dead life, and we're being resurrected, and we're coming to life in a new life that only Jesus can give. Not just a great life full of the, the purpose and the promises of God here on this earth, but I'm talking about life everlasting where you change your eternal address, and God gives you heaven as your inheritance at home. That's only because of who Jesus is that this is even made possible. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's not a way. Jesus is the way. He's not a truth. He embodies everything that is true. He is the truth. And he's not just a, an alternative to life. He is the life. Jesus is our everything. 
He's our everything. And when you allow him to dwell inside of your heart, everything that he is, is dwelling inside of you. So that means everything you need is available to you. Listen, if Jesus isn't your everything, you don't have anything. Apart from the vine as branches, we can do nothing. Jesus has to be everything, all or nothing. Amen, amen. So Jesus went on at the end of this dialogue that he'd been having with his disciples in those last four chapters from 13 to 16, at the end of 16, in John chapter 16 and verse 33, he says this, I have told you all of this. And he's talking about that whole conversation. You should go and read it. It is so, so good. But he says, I've told you all of this so you may have peace in me. Here on earth, and he's just laying it out for them straight, okay? Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But he says, but... Take heart because I have overcome the world. I want you to remember this statement. You've probably heard it maybe before. A quote I've heard, but it says this, peace comes not from the absence of trouble, but from the presence of God. A lot of times we think that in this life, peace is that place where everything is perfect and nothing is going wrong. That's that's not going to happen here on this earth. That's what's going to happen in heaven. But here's what I want to tell you is whatever you're walking through, when you're going through those valleys, when you're walking through those moments and guys, for some people, listen, it's not even those major moments. Okay. For you, if you deal with anxiety and worry, maybe depression, I want to tell you that for you, this may just come on out of nowhere. Nothing massive is happening, okay? I deal with anxiety and I have for many, many years. And out of nowhere, everything could be great. And out of nowhere, there's this oppressive spirit that lays on me of just anxiety. But I'm gonna tell you whether you're in that valley or whether it just comes up on you because the enemy just attacks you in that way, you have to go about it the same way. And this is how you do it. Say who? You say it with me. Say who? Before what? What do I mean by that? You need to focus on who Jesus is, not what is going on. Brad just went through those seven IMs. You need to say who before what. What is going on is all temporary, guys, in the worst of circumstances, whatever it is. Imagine worst case scenario. Then tell yourself this life is all temporary. This is all temporary. Devil, you do not get to reign in my mind and separate and pull me apart with anxiety and fear and worry. Rather, I'm going to take the gift of peace that Jesus gave me and I'm going to allow it to rule and reign and guard my heart and my mind and my soul. Why? Because this is all temporary and heaven is eternal. And Jesus already laid down his life so that you and I could have that eternal home and walk in that peace. Amen. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? I just want to pray for you today. God, I thank you for the peace that you have given us as believers. I thank you, Jesus, that you loved us so much that you went through these four chapters to try to lay out everything we needed to know. You were so honest to tell us that in this world, we're gonna face those trials, but we don't face them alone. I thank you, Jesus, that you're faithful, that you come alongside of us, God, that you carry us through. So this morning, if you're here today, I wanna just tell you, I want to go back to those two types of peace. If you want to experience the peace of God, you have to first make peace with God. What do I mean by that? I mean, you need to be willing to admit that you, just like me, are a sinner in need of a savior. That you, apart from Jesus, are nothing that because we were born into a fallen world, we have a sin nature. And even on our very best day, we cannot live up to God's standard. 
but Jesus laid down his life and because of his blood, our sins can be covered and forgiven and removed. If you're here in this house today and you say, I wanna make Jesus the Lord of my life, I wanna experience his peace, then you first need to just invite him into your heart. You just need to say, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins. I don't wanna be in control. I surrender my life to you. If you're here today or you're watching online and you wanna make that decision with every head bowed, every eye closed, this is just between you and Jesus. I wanna pray for you. Would you just raise your hand? No one's looking around. If you're making that decision today, just raise your hand. You wanna surrender your life. Amen. I see your hands. If you're online, just type all in in the comments. Amen. At this church, no one prays alone, no one stands alone. So I wanna just take a moment and I want you to just pray this prayer after me, all of us together, as we pray with those who are making this decision to invite Jesus in. Just say, dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Jesus, I ask that you would come into my heart, that you would forgive me of my sins I give my life to you. You have control. Let me experience your peace. In Jesus' name, amen.